Hello class, great to see you all again. Uh, I hope everyone's doing well, hope you're happy, healthy, safe, sound, and your loved ones, family as well. Um, today we're going to do something very interesting, something very important, the final branch of government that we have not yet covered. So we have the executive branch, the presidency, we have the legislative branch, the Congress, and today we're going to cover the judicial branch. In this lecture, we're going to look at the Supreme Court. Okay, so let's start. Supreme Court is what we're going to be learning about. And what you're going to be able to surmise from this lecture is a couple things. One, how do you get on the Supreme Court? Two, what do they do? And what powers and attributes do they have unique from the other branches? So if you remember back to Congress, they have the power of the purse, as we call it, or the wallet. They have all the money, right? And you have the executive branch who gets to um, veto bills, sign bills, write executive orders, executive privilege, right? So all the, those two branches all have different powers, and the third branch has is no different. So um, in no particular order, let's let's take it away. How do you become a Supreme Court justice? Let's start here. There are nine Supreme Court justices. Nine. Okay? So, I'll give you a few. Your job is to look up the rest and see. Uh, I, won't, I won't hold you to memorizing them, but I want you to at least go peruse. Peruse. Um, so we've got, uh, in no particular order, we've got uh, Sotomayor, I'm just going to do all last names, Justice Sotomayor, Justice Thomas, Justice Ginsburg, some people call her uh, RBG because she's her name is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, so she's kind of like one of the cool Supreme Court justices, I guess you could say, she has uh, like little memes calling her the notorious RBG. You guys know Notorious B.I.G. Um, so, and it's kind of funny because, you know, not to be mean, but Supreme Court justices are kind of nerds, right? They're brilliant, and we may disagree with them, but they, they're they going to be smart to be the law. So it's, 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 it's funny to see, you know, her take on that. Um, just go look it up. I think you'll, you'll, you'll get a laugh. So Notorious R.B.G. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, then we have other, cons um, and I'll explain what I mean with conservative and liberal judges, but so considered more conservative judges, but not necessarily even in recent cases, um, like DACA. And if you don't know what DACA is, I'm going to tell you just really quickly. DACA is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. It was a Obama-era executive action that allowed people who were here born not born here but just here from a young age and and identified essentially as american to stay and um the supreme court just upheld that so i was talking about potentially liberal and conservative you don't know necessarily what these justices will do once they get on the bench but some of the considered more conservative definitely um justice clarence thomas i already mentioned him maybe the most conservative on the bench um the, uh, justice alito you have uh, Justice Kagan, uh, another female justice put on by uh, President Obama. Then you have the two Trump uh, Supreme Court justices so far. And I say that because we don't know, you know, what's going to happen. Um, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh. And if you were even remotely politically aware, uh, you know who Kavanaugh is. Uh, you've heard his name and there's a huge question mark um with the me too movement and you know what 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 happened did anything happen it was a huge it was a huge deal um it was, it was the hugest deal um so if in what, what i'm talking about was um justice kavanaugh in his confirmation hearings and dr ford and if you're not familiar with that you, you need to know a little bit about that go go look up you know, Me Too and Justice Kavanaugh. I'm not going to take uh, any side, but it shows you one thing politically, aside from everything else. It shows you that 
getting on the Supreme Court is a really big deal. A really, really, really big deal. It's arguably bigger than becoming president. I, I would say it is bigger. And sorry if you are president, but think about this. If you're president, the most you can get is eight years, right? The most you can get. Okay, so think about this. President FDR ended up having more than eight years. So how did that happen? Just quickly, a little piece of history. FDR, George Washington ran four years and four years, and then after that, he stepped down. He So a lot of people are like, we want you to run, and he's like, well, we came away from a king. We don't want a king again. No, no, I'm not running more. So he stopped after eight years. But there wasn't an officially a rule. Does that make sense? So it was just what's called a precedent. P-R-E-C-E-D-E-N-T. A precedent is a fancy way of saying like a tradition. So George Washington steps down after eight years and all the other presidents do the same or they just won one term until FDR, who was really popular at the time and um, just kept running until after he passed away, the United States officially changed the Constitution. So, and you all remember how uh, one of the ways we do that, three-fourths of states can vote to, to, to essentially change the Constitution. So now you can only do two terms as president. So arguably, Supreme Court's more powerful because you're there for life. Okay, so go look up the other justices, but you've got nine justices, okay? And for this class, we're, we're going to focus on the, the, this next part too, what, why are they there? How do they get there? And what can they do? What power do they actually have? So the first thing you could write down about, I don't know, their powers and attributes, their characteristics is number one. And this is why I think they could be arguably more powerful than a president. They're there for life. So if someone gets nominated to the Supreme Court, I think we've said this already previously, but now we're really going to address it. Someone gets nominated to the Supreme Court. There's only one way it can happen. Okay. So, and go look up the Justice Kavanaugh thing and you'll see how intense this process can be. So, the United States, well, first of all, the president will nominate someone. Then the United States Senate will vote yes or no. So, imagine this. President Trump puts someone forward and... There are more Republicans in the Senate than there are Democrats. You can almost guarantee that that person's going to get on, right? I mean, why do I say that? Because partisanship is just a part of politics. It's, to me, it's personally, it's sad, but I'll teach you just briefly. Partisan, the word partisan is somebody who takes a side politically favoring a party favoring one political party or the other. Now, I mean, there's you could be like a small party partisan, but mostly we're talking about Republicans and Democrats who are kind of set in their ways, unwilling to compromise with the other side. Um, this is important. If you have the Senate and the judge you're nominating is somebody that makes the, the majority of the Senate happy, like if you're a Republican president, you would put on someone more conservative, most likely. You can basically guarantee that that person is going to get voted in, right? So the president nominates in the Senate. So there's only one way to get on the Supreme Court. President nominates. Senate does their job, at least 51 to 50. How could it be if there's only 100 senators, a 51-50 vote? Some of you all are answering. The vice president, if it was 50-50, would come in and break the tie. So you will get a yes or no vote. Um, someone asked me, um, has it ever happened that a Supreme Court justice gets nominated and then gets to the Senate and just gets voted down, doesn't get in? And the last time that happened was someone named Robert Bork. So you can go look some of these things up. They're kind of some, some interesting stories. But basically, Robert Bork was... A very, very conservative justice that was put forward by Ronald Reagan and went, you know, to the Senate to do his thing and try to get on the Supreme Court. And if you want to be objective and not just say, like, well, he was too conservative and that's why, I think the mistake he made, 
because I don't want to take sides in like the Republican or Democrat or was he too conservative? What he was too honest. In other words, let me. If the Senate asks you as a judge, you know, what do you think of Roe versus Wade, which is the landmark uh, abortion ruling that decided that no state could make it a crime for women to get an abortion, right? If you ask a Supreme Court justice or to be a Senate, Senate's asking this person about to be on the Supreme Court, you know, what do you think of a ruling like that? Every single justice you're going to hear since him will say something like Roe versus Wade is established law. You know, I, I respect precedent and they won't really, if they disagree with Roe v. Wade, that's what I'm saying. They won't say it for like out loud, loudly. If they disagree with another contentious court case in American history, they're not going to loudly shout that anymore. But Robert Bork was a little bit too honest about what he felt. Um, and so senators just were, I mean, essentially, now conservatives say, many say that, you know, what happened to Robert Bork was unfair. The media sort of twisted his views and, and the Democrats just made politics of it. I'm, I have to be honest with you. Every, I mean, that, there may be some truth to that, but I will say every single person that's going to go on the Supreme Court for the rest of our lives it's going to be a really big deal, and it's going to be a contentious hearing, and it's going to be partisan. It's going to be partisan. What that means is it's going to be parties against each other. I mean, be, why? Because the president's gone after eight years at most. But guess how long the Supreme Court stays? As long as they want. No one has ever been fully impeached from the Supreme Court. It would only be over something really major. And the closest that happened was in the 1800s. Someone got, just like President Trump, impeached in the House, but not, but not, um, but acquitted in the Senate. So they didn't get fully. They stay. Okay, so, so just think about this. Number one on our list for you know we have we now we know they have nine people and we know how they get there. But number one on the list of their powers, attributes, characteristics is they are there for life. And man, that is a pretty sweet job, isn't it? Have you ever had a teacher that's tenured? I'm just telling you all right now, I'm not, which is why I'm still nice. But sometimes it's kind of a joke that, you know, tenured professors will, will be like the more rude one. If you don't know what tenure is, it's like every teacher's dream. It's like getting on the Supreme Court kind of. It's like you almost have a, a job that you can't lose unless you, unless you do something like egregious, right? So, so Imagine the same thing is true for the Supreme Court. You're not going to be removed unless it's something egregious and it's never happened. So you're there for life. All right. So number two, what else is unique about the Supreme Court? This is what's unique. Number two on our list is the Supreme Court can rule that any law in any state at any time is unconstitutional. So number two is what they can, they declare as the sort of the final word, whether something is constitutional or not, they decide. So let me give you some big ones in our lifetime, gay marriage, right? That's, that is huge. They're deciding that for the whole country. So guess what happened? Gay marriage is legalized. Then basically the next day. I think it was maybe a, over the weekend or something. And then a Monday comes and there's a lady, I believe her name was Kim Davis of Kentucky. And I don't know anything else about this person except for this one thing. The Supreme Court cases usually take a long time to get up to the top from the from these local courts. But this lady, Kim Davis, objected to the Supreme Court's ruling from a couple days before. So gay marriage is legalized. Just think a couple years ago, right? Gay marriage is legalized by the Supreme Court. We're found to be constitutionally legal, right? Kim Davis, like the next day, basically says, she's a lady that lives in Kentucky. She says, I don't feel religiously right or I can't, I can't give out a marriage certificate to a gay couple is what she says. The Supreme Court did something remarkable. Remember, I was just telling you, it could take years to get to the Supreme Court. 
they pretty much, I mean, they didn't quite tweet it, but they they pretty much made a, a very direct, quick ruling and just said, anyone like Kim Davis, no offense, it, we're not belittling your religious views, but you, they didn't quite say this, but this is what the essence was. You, you can have religious views, but if they prevent you from doing what the law says you must do at that job, then you got to get another job. Isn't that so, so? How powerful is that? How po that's the Supreme Court. Now, it's true that if it would be scary if a president ignored the Supreme Court. In other words, Supreme Court set a law and the president's like, no, I just won't allow gay marriage or something. But you could see how that would be very difficult to do, right? I mean, this, in other words, the Supreme Court rules, and it's a, it's. I'm not going to say it's unbreakable, but it is. That goes back to that precedent. Once the Supreme Court rules on something, once there's a ruling or tradition, that first one is very hard to to turn around. Now, there's some really, really bad precedents, ones that make me sick to my stomach, like Plessy versus Ferguson or Dred Scott where the United States Supreme Court at the time was just unbelievably racist. And and then later, we'll take a case like Brown versus Board of Education, 60, 50, I'm trying to do the math, 56 years later, I think, um, and completely turn Plessy versus Ferguson upside down and say, Plessy versus Ferguson basically just said, separate but equal is equal. So it said segregation is fine black and white people in different places and everyone knew it wasn't that black and white people were in different places and everything was equal it was that black and white people were in different places and things were very unequal and that's just one of the problems with segregation so supreme court can rule and this is our number two here on our list can rule anything that they deem unconstitutional essentially null and void they can just say that law that state law can't exist and and they're overruling it and so if they say it to one state all 50 states it applies to all 50 states so go back to that analogy i used in federalism you got the grandparents the parents and the kids the grandparents say something and they really mean it then everyone has to obey the parents have to enforce it to the kids and kim davis's of the world have to give out a marriage certificate because that's the supreme court's ruling that's a big deal, isn't it? So number three, here's a really great thing about Supreme Court justices, and this is something that prevents bribery. So number three is that Supreme Court is supposed to have and does have steady pay. In other words, what are we saying? You are not allowed, as a president, you have no money, right? What do you mean? President Trump's a billionaire. What I mean is he has his own money. He doesn't have any government money. Congress has the government money, right? So Congress would have to give him government money to do anything, right? So for number three on our list, we're looking at, first and foremost, you have someone who's there for life, who's ruling on whether something's constitutional. And now they're in a position where they can basically make a ruling that everyone in the entire country will have to. To abide by so is it possible that in the wrong setting they could be bribed because this everything is such high stakes yeah it's possible and that's what the the the, the writers of the constitution found the founders wanted to make sure it didn't happen you don't want to do this you don't want to say oh supreme court you just ruled in favor of you know let's say it's the trump administration because he's in office right now and he says oh you ruled in favor of me on this I'm going to ask Congress to bump your pay up or Congress is really mad that the Supreme Court just ruled this thing. So Congress says we're going to dock the pay of the people who voted that way or the people who ruled that way on the Supreme Court. I mean, I guess it's a vote. You could call it that. So of the nine members, you need steady pay. Why? So that none of them can be bribed so that you can't say, hey, you know, uh, Justice so-and-so. I know that uh, this ruling's really big and, you know, your son might like to, your daughter might like to go to, you know, Harvard and I'm on the admissions board and here's a yacht and he that can't happen. 
And if it did, they would be impeached. Um, and we'd find out about it. This is good news, guys. Number three is really good news. Steady pay. The Congress or the president, if either one, obviously the president has to go through Congress to get the money. Nobody can can bump their... Now, if there's a cost of living raise because over time money loses value because of inflation, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about bribing them or punishing them based on their performance in, in their job. And they should not... We all know this. They should be blind, right? Justice is blind. And it's because they're not going to look at anything other than what's right and wrong and what's constitutional or not. Okay? So, so three is huge. Can't can't touch their pay. Number four, let's keep going. Okay, so we've got nine members, right? And we've got these people who are there. So let's, for number four, let's, let's ask this question. What cases can the Supreme Court take? Because in the next lecture, we're going to talk about there's criminal and there's civil court. And there's also military court, immigration court, and so on. But the, how, what, what cases can the Supreme Court take? And essentially, the answer, uh, the answer is essentially, essentially all of them. All of them. So, but number four, we're going to ask this question. So, so for number four, you could say this. The Supreme Court can take up any case they want. But here's what you need to write for number four. And it's lucky that it's number four. It's going to be easy to remember. It, there's something called the rule of four. Okay? So imagine you are at a local court filing a lawsuit against the government or whoever, and it gets all the way up and it goes through all the other courts, the state Supreme Court, federal appeals court, and it gets to the Supreme Court. Does that mean that just because this judge said no, the federal final federal appeals said no, that the Supreme Court has to say, yeah, we'll take it. No, they don't have to take it. In other words, can you appeal to a higher power and the higher power says, no, I defer to this power? Yeah, of course. Does the Supreme Court just give you a picture? The book says there are over 10 million cases a year that could go to the Supreme Court. And only 75 to 80 is how many they actually take on. To, that talk about like lottery chances of winning. <laughs> You're not. It's not. It's not easy to get to the Supreme Court. So how do you get there? You start right. You would file your your grievance, your lawsuit, the criminal activity, or whatever is wherever that happened. It might have happened in Washington D.C. In which case they would have what's called original jurisdiction. But if it isn't for an ambassador or someone like that, it's a normal person, not in D.C. The Supreme Court is going to be able to take on that case and they're going to be able to decide for the entire country whether it's legal or not. And now we've got some idea of how it gets there. But they have 10 million cases that they can choose from. Now, let's start with the 10 million at the bottom. Those are local uh, and state cases that could potentially they have constitutional questions involved in them. And so they could go up to the Supreme Court. OK, but. After 10 million, you're looking at it's whittled down to, you know, uh, less than a million on the first appeal. Why? Because if you're this judge and you've made a determination and you're the judge above them that has a little bit more power, right? Why, if you're this judge that has more power, would you overrule this judge? You might do it because you just like being more powerful. But here's the here's what could go wrong. You overrule this judge, and this judge was right. And now you let a criminal out of jail, or you made a bad seat. So there's a risk to the higher judge. Up, like, there's a risk. Do I? You could mess it up. And, and, and there's another thing. Maybe the case down here was decided correctly. And so you, the, the other judge was like, I don't, there, I don't need to take it. It's done. And that's it. So does that make sense? So the appeal process to the mercy of the, the court as you go up and up and up. So all 50 states, every single one has a Supreme Court. Yes, California has a California Supreme Court. So if you're on the California Supreme Court, can you decide stuff for the entire country? No. But if a case arises in California, you're the last stop until it goes to the federal level. So that's that's a huge deal, right? So 
as it goes through these appeals, it goes from 10 million to 800,000 to 75 cases, potentially 80, 75 to 80 cases. Supreme Court actually takes. And so this is for, for our number four here. There have to be four of the nine justices once it gets there, which is already going to take years, perhaps millions of dollars, and maybe a little bit of luck, if you want to say. By the time you get here, four justices have to say, yeah, you know what? All these other judges, 10 other judges blow you, they, nah. The, the three other trials you had, or what, whatever the, the case is, four of those justices decide to take a case, the Supreme Court's taking it. Now, it's I think it's really significant that the number's not five. In other words, you don't have to have five Supreme Court justices decide to take on a case. It's only four. Why does that matter? Well, because if there's nine, a majority would be five, right? And so you don't want to pre-decide the case. Is that is, is how I see it, right? Um, now, it's possible that all nine justices want to take on the case, and then they vote 7-2 or, you know, there's all different possibilities. But I will say this because I know someone's going to ask, and it's a great question. Thank you for asking. What happens if one of the Supreme Court justices is dead and there's no one in his place or her place, and now we only have eight people? And it's four to four. Who breaks the tie? Drum roll. No one. No one breaks it. It goes back down to the lower court's ruling. Whatever the the, the court right below said, that's it. So can I? I'm going to give you a real life example of this. If you're paying attention carefully, I may put this on the test. It's a great question, which is, what happens? If a president inherits a Supreme Court vacancy, in other words, someone dies on the Supreme Court, what if the president nominates someone and the Senate decides they don't want to vote on that person because another presidential co election is coming up and they hope that their party will win? And if they vote on this person, this person might get in and they're a Democrat. And if I'm a Republican, I wouldn't want that. Is this type of thing, could that, could that even happen? Yes, it did. And obviously I was leading you towards an example. This is one of the, I don't take sides. It's not Republican or Democrat, but for me to decide, but for, for you to know the story, you have to know wh where the sides were. Could it, could it have been the Democrats doing the same thing? To be honest, the partisanship in our country is so heavy that I wouldn't, necessarily be surprised but either way listen to the story and i'll tell you where concern comes in and again i'm not picking on republican or democrat it's just not constitutional okay so what happened was there was a, a justice named antonin scalia and he died in 2016 in obama's you know uh last year in office he'd already won re-election he can't run again so obama's right he's He's in his final year. He doesn't leave until it's February of 2016 when Scalia dies. Obama's not actually leaving office until January of 2017. Why? Because inauguration, right? It takes a while. We want to transition between leaders. Okay. So he has a, basically a year left in his presidency, 11 months. And he says, okay. This is, um, we know we're so sorry Scalia died, and now the process is two from these eight people, add one more, let's get back to nine. That's what the Constitution says. So just so you know what the Constitution says, the actual verbiage for this is to advise and consent. To advise and consent what? To the president's nominees for the Supreme Court. They have to advise and consent. If you want to put that in plain English, it's what I've been telling you all along, right? They have to vote yes or no. And in advising, they're going to have that person in front of them, and they're going to ask them questions like they did to Justice Kavanaugh. If you saw that, you need to know about that. So go look that up, as I said, to Justice Bork, to any justice. Um, some will be more contentious than others. But is this 
making sense. So it's very important that you understand the president is going to nominate someone. But if the Senate doesn't vote on that person, then the president's nominee is just going to sit there in purgatory like in between lands, not knowing. So, so this is going back. This actually happened, and it's a it's a constitutional concern because it says advise and consent in the Constitution, right? So Obama says, "Here's Justice Garland. He's a justice already, but not for the Supreme Court. I think he's ready for the Supreme Court. I'm putting him up for nomination." And guess what? Mitch McConnell, who is the head of the Senate at the time, and still, as the Republicans have more people in the Senate, Mitch McConnell says, well, he didn't quite say this, but I'm adding this part. Although the Constitution says advise and consent, the Constitution doesn't say that in an election year it's a good idea. And uh, so now I'm giving you Mitch McConnell's reasoning. He said, look, I know it's only February, but... The elections this year, it's going to be Hillary and Trump, it looks like. And we don't want to put a new Supreme Court justice on now because we we won't be able to have a fair vote. The vote will just be a political game leading up to the election. So we're just not going to, sorry, Obama, here's your justice. We're not going to advise and consent. What about all the Democrats and other Republicans who wanted to? Well, under Senate rules... His Mitch McConnell's in charge, so it's like Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi can can dictate certain things in the House. Mitch McConnell shut it down, and Justice Garland, poor guy, he never even got a hearing. He never got to meet with any of the Republican leadership in the Senate. They just ignored him for eleven months, and then. When Trump came in, something extraordinary has happened. Hillary Clinton and Trump are running against each other, right? The major two candidates, anyway. And there are only eight people on the Supreme Court. Did you all know that? When you were voting last time for whoever you voted for, if you didn't vote, that's that's the background to that. There were only eight people on the Supreme Court, meaning what? For an unbelievable luck, whoever was winning... And no, I don't mean that in any disrespect to Anson Scalia, but obviously. But there was a vacancy on the Supreme Court. There's eight people, whether someone died or retired. It's so rare that you're going to be elected and the first thing you're going to be able to do, like first, first thing is put on someone on the Supreme Court that will be there for 40, 50, who knows how long, years. So now do you understand why the stakes of Hillary Clinton and Trump were so high? Because... Obama had put someone on to this, go to the Supreme Court. The Senate was like, nope, we're out of the picture here. We're not even going to hear this person. We're not even going to talk to them in any official capacity. And so Justice Carlin, I mean, I'm, I'm laughing because I feel sorry for him. I'm not, I don't know anything about him to take a side other than he didn't get the Senate questioning that everyone else gets. Because the Republicans in this time, through Mitch McConnell, I mean, look, again, I'm not taking sides. If you want to look at it, just pure political strategy, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. You just don't let the person do their constitutional duty. You just wait till they leave and then have someone who's on your side, a Republican, then you'll easily vote them in. It's brilliant. Here's the problem with it. It's unconstitutional. It doesn't say advising consent after 11 months. It just, I mean, but, but I mean, in fairness to Mitch McConnell, which I can't, this is going to be hard for me to do, but to defend that he's going to say it doesn't, the constitution doesn't specify a time frame. So I know I can't say much more, but that, that is the real life. It's, it's drama of this getting on the Supreme court or not. And so um, I'll tell you one more interesting thing that um, that I think will if you're like a Democrat right now and you're like, man, he just told me this story about Republicans stonewalling the Democrats. 
is there any democratic victory in this? So again, since I don't take either side, I, I think both parties are equally. So since I don't take a side, it's easy for me to say, hey, the Democrats are so excited at the possibility that the person that Trump put in, which was to replace Scalia's um, absence, death, was Neil Gorsuch. Kavanaugh was the second one. So Gorsuch, if you've never heard of this person, this is a Supreme Court justice. It turns out it it looks like he has quite a liberal side to him. And what I mean is the LGBTQ plus ruling that just came out of the Supreme Court a couple days ago, go look it up. It's a huge deal. Um, and I mean, Trump is Trump disagrees with the ruling. Mike Pence really disagrees. Um, and the ruling is essentially to protect LGBTQ plus workers um, from discrimination in the same way that people, men or women, can't be. Like, there, there's just no gender discrimination whatsoever is essentially what they ruled. And Trump said on Twitter, I'm getting the feeling the Supreme Court doesn't like me. I thought that was funny because... The Supreme Court's independent of the president. Once they get on, they can rule against the president that put them there. In fact, you should applaud. I mean, whether you agree or disagree, you, you should applaud them at least for their independence, right? For a judge to be able to separate themselves and say, I'm not like, I know this person nominated me, but I disagree with that law that they that they're pushing. And so I have to do what's right, you know? One last story about the Supreme Court. This is the heartwarming story. Um, some of you know Justice John Roberts because he is the chief justice, which basically means like he's in charge of the Supreme Court. Um, he was nominated by President George W. Bush in 2006. Okay. So who's the senator in 2006 that later became president? President or senator back then, Obama, right? Stay with me. President George W. Bush, Republican puts Roberts forward as a nominee and it goes to the Senate and Obama's in the Senate and Obama's in his, you know, own admission, progressive, liberal. This guy is not John Roberts. So Obama with his vote decides to vote Roberts down. In other words, he says, no, I don't want Roberts on the Supreme court. I'd rather the president put someone else forward, but Roberts had enough votes in the Senate to go in anyway. So, Obama votes no, but it wasn't, it was in the minority vote, less than 49, 49 or less. So he didn't, he didn't stop him. He, Roberts got in anyway, right? No, that can happen. That's normal. But here's the cool part. Guess what happens two years later? Well, Obama becomes president and guess who swears in the president? The chief justice of the Supreme Court. So this is a heartwarming story about American politics to me because it shows that we can have some civility. Um, do you all see that Trump or, or excuse me, Nancy Pelosi tried to shake Trump's hand before the state of the union address and he just turned and ignored it. That was heartbreaking to me. And to some people it was heartbreaking when she tore the speech up. I'm not going to give my opinion on that, but I will say, isn't it nice though, if we didn't have that type of discord in our politics. Like if our politicians were at least acting like it was, you know, they got along. Um, here's a heartwarming story for you. If the state of the union made you sad on the snubbed handshake or the, the speech, um, John Roberts swore in Obama after Obama voted him down. And here's the funny thing about this that most of you might not know. As if Obama hasn't been through enough with a birther conspiracy that I told you about last time. John Roberts is, is nervous. I mean, I'm, everyone's nervous there that, that's getting involved in the administration. But Roberts and Obama are like face-to-face, -face, hand in the Bible. Obama's hand in the Bible. Roberts is saying, uphold, defend, and protect the Constitution. And says it in the wrong order. Protect, uphold, and defend, and defend, uphold, and protect. He just says the right words from the Constitution out of order. He says the right words out of order. And so he asks Obama to repeat them. Right? Like you're at a wedding. And then you're like, repeat the statement. I do. Or whatever. 
Well, I think I do is all you said. He says, repeat, you know, do you agree to do this? And then Obama, you can, you can see that Obama, as he's saying it, knows that, that Roberts has said the phrase out of order. But he's re but he's been asked in front of the whole world to repeat this, and it has to happen in one. So if he repeated what Roberts said in the right way, it would have made Roberts look wrong, and so he he repeats the wrong way that Roberts said, and nobody notices except for political nerds like me. And so he was a now some people who had different intentions were like, oh, that means he's not president because he didn't really swear in. So guess what they did. John Roberts and President Obama went inside and did it again. I think there's a picture in the book. I'm not sure if it's the presidency chapter or if it's the judiciary, but you could find it uh, just by Googling it. The image of John Roberts re-swearing in President Obama with no one really around, like four people or something, someone taking the picture, just to make sure they did it right. Okay? So... That's kind of a heartwarming story that, you know, even though President Obama, Obama voted Roberts down, Roberts, you know, swore him in and there's this peaceful transition of power. That, that, that's something good for our country, right? Which I hope continues. All right. Speaking of continuing, I think we've got a good, solid grasp here of the Supreme Court. Comments and questions, go for it. Post away. And I will... See you in a little bit for civil versus criminal courts, which I think you'll find hopefully just as interesting or maybe even more. All right. See you all soon.